Good afternoon. Welcome to Gambling with an Edge. I'm Bob Dancer. And I'm Richard Munchkin. Our guest today is a repeat visit by one of the major gurus in blackjack theory and practice, Arnold Snyder. And we're here to continue our discussion of his new book, Radical Blackjack. Arnold Snyder, welcome back to Gambling with an Edge. Yeah, glad to be here. You and your wife, Radar, seem to have perfected the art of talking absolute nonsense to casino employees when you're describing why you play differently than most other players do. Like, for example, doubling down on a 12 versus a 2. Can you give us some examples of some of the things you've said and why you say it that way? Yeah, well, a whole lot of this really came from Radar. Uh, I didn't know this when I met her, but she is uh, an incredible actress. Uh, she was, she's very intelligent. I mean, she she went to Harvard on a full scholarship in science, and uh, finished her, her her bachelor's in in three years. Um, you know, she's just she's you know way beyond your normal person in just intelligence. But she really enjoyed acting like just this girl bimbo, and she would just she would just sort of act like this girl that was superstitious about everything and had crazy ideas about things and just was trying to have fun. And she was actually, that really was at the tables, for the most part, the brains of our operation. She was the one who was keeping track of the cards, uh, tracking the shuffles, um, you know, basically telling me, usually with signals beneath the table, um, and or just turning and, and whispering in my ear. She always just acted like she was hanging on me, like I was her boyfriend. And and um, and she just started doing crazy things. And uh, I enjoyed enjoyed it immensely. Um, and, you know, she figured out the things that we had difficulties with, like, uh, for instance, um, when you're tracking shuffles, um, you want to bet uh, the most you can bet when you're in a tracked slug, meaning you're in the section of the shoe where you know the high cards, the, the faces and aces are located. You want to bet the maximum amount. And, it, and as soon as you're out of that, you know that you're, there are, you know, there's a, not many tens and aces left. And so you want to bet very small. You know, now card counters, they increase their bets and decrease their bets pretty slowly. Because, again, if you're in, say, a six-deck shoe, the count goes up slowly and goes back down slowly for the most part so that you can slowly get your bets raised as you, know, as you get deeper into the shoe or lower them. Whereas with shuffle tracking, it's not like that. There's a certain section of the shoe you go, okay, that's where we want to bet. And the rest of the sections of the shoe, or at least as far as you know, are – are places where you don't you would like to bet the least um you know like what card counters do in shoe games is they they table hop um they or what they call back counting they stand behind the table or they have uh cohorts standing behind tables or even sitting there and playing minimum calling them in and out of shoes so that they they can only they only have to bet big when they are in the section where the uh the high cards are um, now, with shuffle tracking, you know, we don't have people doing that. We basically are sitting there because we have to track the shoe for the next shuffle. We can't, you know, we can't come in and out and, you know, walk around. And so what she would do is she started just doing crazy things. Like she would, one thing she said, and constantly was saying, we have to change the order of the cards. So by changing the order of the cards, she would say, well, we have to do something crazy, like as if the cards, as if the deck had some kind of a, a mentality and it was, you know, there was, there was something it was watching for to keep things normal or whatever. And she would say, um, okay, so you've got to play this hand wrong. And I'd say, well, what do you want me to do? And I, I might have a, um, a stiff against a, a high card. She said, well, you have to hit that. And I'd be like, I never hit 15 against a, a, a you know, 
a three. That's crazy. You know, that's way it's a violation of basic strategy. You know, she'd say, no, no, no. But we have to do it to change the order of the cards. Now, we this is to... when you have a very small bet, right? Right. Right. Yes. Because because, well, of course, I could have a big bet and she wants me to bring it down. In other words, she would use this this tactic to either be able to raise a bet or lower a bet suddenly and big. And I mean big, because we would be spreading from, in the casinos where we played, we would split, spread from the table minimum to the table maximum. Uh, a lot of these casinos... Like $25 to $2,000 or something? Yeah, well, a lot of the casinos where we were playing had uh, had $10,000 maximums, and they were allowing us to spread to multiple hands. And so I might from 25 go, to multiple hands well, of 10000 we probably I think have $100 we, minimums or Yeah, something. we always played at $100 minimum tables. Um, but still, a, a spread of several hundred to one. Yes. Which most card counters right. are happy to eke out, you know, right. 12 or 16. Right. I would actually, uh, on numerous occasions, I would raise my bet from a single hand of $100 to six hands of 10000 each. Well, that's crazy. No card counter would ever do that. One of the things is when you're doing things that are so unusual, no card counter would ever do them. That the casino is just there scratching their heads like, what is with these people? You know, the, like this guy obviously is loaded. He's got just got money coming out of his ears. He's trying to please his girlfriend. And she's uh, some kind of scatterbrain, superstitious. You know, she would say things like, um, oh, there's there are too many red cards coming out or too many black cards coming out. And that means this, you know, the black cards mean the deck is cold. You got it. You got, you know, oh, we've had all the black cards coming out pretty soon. The red ones watch the hearts and diamonds are coming. You better get some like as if the suits of the cards <laughs> had something to do with whether or not your hands were going to win or lose. You know, just crazy things like this. And she would do this with a completely straight face. You know, she would say she would build crazy stacks of chips and she'd pull my bat, bet back and say, here, bet this. And she'd just push out a crazy stack of chips. You know, some casinos would would disallow it. They would say, no, you, you know, your wife or your girlfriend. I mean, she played. I, I played with her while she was my girlfriend. Then we got married and she was my wife. But I was always like this this long suffering guy <laughs> trying to trying to please his, his significant other and you know, keep her happy. And to me, it was almost like, you know, they just thought money doesn't seem to matter to him. You know, it's just like. He doesn't care if he's betting a hundred or he's betting ten thousand. It's just it's just a bet, and you know. So you know, it really came from her um, deciding to put on this act in order to get these crazy bet spreads, what and some, it worked. <laughs> what some guys will do to get laid. Uh, <laughs> speaking of getting laid, what was the strangest comp you were offered? Uh, okay, this was a uh, this was a comp where. Um, uh, we were, we were playing in a, a loss rebate game and, uh, and I was spreading the table max, which in fact was six times 10,000. And, um, and I was offered, uh, I, you know, well, I had, had, let's just say I had really done this a whole lot the night before, uh, the next night they were having a, uh, a party for their high rollers. And, um, you know, we were there and they just had, you know, caviar and lobster and just all this great food and champagne and, you know, and, um, you know, they had like a jazz band playing in the corner. It was just a, you know, just like, here's a party that, you know, for our high rollers. Well, as I was sitting there next to, next to Radar, uh, a host came up to me, and he wasn't my regular host at this casino, which I will not, I, I won't name the casino. Um, but he came up to me and he said, um, he said, are, are you going to be, uh, are you going to be uh, available to, to come to town uh, on such and such dates? And it was like about five, six weeks in the future. And I said, well, I don't know. I'll have to check my schedule. Is there something happening here? And he said, well, you don't want to miss this. This is our, our, our penthouse weekend. I said, your penthouse weekend. I said, well, what does that mean? He said, well, 
Um, we're going to have a, a, a group of penthouse pets here, and we'll have a party uh, the first evening. And um, you get there will be a bunch of them there, and the magazines will be there, so you can see their pictures. You know that these are real penthouse pets, and um, and you get to pair up with one of them for the weekend. And I was like, uh, "What do you mean by um, you know pair up with one of them?" <laughs> and he said, "Well." You know, she'll stay in your room. She eats with you. She sleeps with you. She's like your girlfriend for the weekend. And I said, well, you know, I'm not sure my wife would go for us having a penthouse pet in our room for the weekend. <laughs> and he said, no. That's a smart conclusion. <laughs> he said, she was literally sitting right next to me, but she couldn't hear this because he was like sort of talking confidentially, you know, <laughs> to me, you know, real close. And, uh, and he said, oh, no, you know, he like socked me in the arm and said, oh, you know, you tell your wife you're on a business trip this weekend. And I said, well, OK. And he gave me his card and said, you know, just just call me. We'll we'll, we'll get you set up for the weekend. And uh, as soon as he left, I turned to Radar and I said, you'll never guess the comp I was just offered. And um, and I explained exactly, you know, what he said. And and she said, um, um, well, you're going to do it, aren't you? <laughs> and I said, <laughs> I said, baby, we just got married. We just got married a month or a couple months ago. You know, I'm not trying to get divorced already. And um, and, you know, she said, oh, no, no. But still, you're a writer. Think of the story you could tell. I agree with Radar. <laughs> <laughs> I have been married or had a number of girlfriends. And I have never been with a lady who would have encouraged me to go to something like that. Actually, right. I think the best story would have been if she went with you. <laughs> it might have been good, yeah. Or maybe but, instead uh, of you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but as it turned out, we, you know, we we weren't that crazy about that the shuffle in that casino. This is going to be an, and a, a, another casino. Yeah, yeah, and I knew that there was no way I would try to track that shuffle myself. So mm -hmm. I wasn't going to try to do it without radar. And, um, you know, and, and we talked about possibilities. Well, maybe I can put a team together and, you know, they could back count. And I, can, and I just thought, nah, this ain't going to work, you know. Plus, my real feeling was... Um, there's no way this will go over big at home. <laughs> you know, she's she's being awfully nice by just saying, you know, hey, think of the story you could tell. You know, but <laughs> it's still a pretty good story even without following through. Yeah, tell us about Keith and Marty Taft. Well, let's see. Um, I uh, admired Keith for years. Um, just you know, I you know I don't know when the first time I heard about him was probably from Ken Houston started talking about he had, you know he had a spread in Sports Illustrated where he was demonstrating the the um, the David computer I think Ken was the one that called it David um, and it was the the his his concealed computer where you had the switches in your in your boots that you operated with your toes and it sent signals via vibrations you know to your legs and you know there were wires running up and down your pant legs you know, it was a it was a crazy thing but it worked and um and so i i was aware of him uh probably for a few years um it was in the early 80s though uh what happened was uh, there was a i was contacted by a guy in las vegas he the game, name he gave me was george stevens which wasn't his real name which i'll fail to mention anyway because he's not really an important person um, but he he contacted me and said well I have a um, I have a concealable computer uh, um, I'd like you to s s look at it and see if you're interested in selling it for me and um, I came out to Vegas and and um, met with him and he demonstrated the computer um, you know, and I, I was impressed. I would, you know, this is, this is cool. You know, he showed me how it worked and how, it, you know. Um, and so I, in the next issue of Blackjack Forum, uh, I ex described the computer and, and, I, and I can't remember the price. It might have been $1,800 or something like that. Yeah, 2000 as I recall. Yeah. I think it was um, but anyway, so um, I advertised it. Well, I'd say probably within a week, I got a, a call 
and it was Marty Taft. He said, yeah, this is Marty Taft. I'm Keith Taft's son. And, um, you know, you have this this article about this. I'm trying to think what he called uh, that computer he was selling. He didn't call it David. He called it George, I think. Was it George? I, yeah. You know, okay. But anyway, he um, he he um, he said, from your description of that computer, it sounds like it's a bootleg copy of uh, my dad's computer, Keith's computer. And um, he said, you know, um, you know, this is a we had an, a, a, an employee who was uh, helping us build these computers and he left our employ. And um, we think he took all the schematics and the instructions and, you know, he, he learned the whole operation. He knows how to build them. And I think that's what you have. And I said, you know, well, you know, I have great admiration for Keith and I really wouldn't want to be selling bootleg copies of, of his invention. Um, and he's and Marty said, why don't you come out, come out to um, to Keith's house and um will demonstrate I, so you can decide for yourself if this is it so I, I went out there and this is the first time i met keith and marty and um keith's wife uh, i mean just they're they, these are just some of the just the nicest people it um, reminded me of staying at my grandmother's house yeah it's you know they <laughs> it, it they're yeah i mean their house was so just normal american and, you know, nothing fancy, lavish, nothing. You know, it was just a little house and a little street, you know, a nice little neighborhood, you know. Pot roast for dinner. In, uh, it, Pal- actually, right. yeah. 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 Or casserole, I think we had. Yeah. yeah. It was, uh, you know, it was uh, in Palo Alto. And Palo Alto or Sunnyvale? I think Sunnyvale. It was in that area. You know, at, that, the, at the time that I went, um, it he, he was out by uh, Walnut, I think it was called. Walnut or- Creek. Walnut Creek, maybe? Mm, yeah, out maybe. near Sacramento, kind of. Yeah. Hmm. Um, okay, well, this, I believe this was in Sunnyvale. It, it's, it's a like another suburb of San Jose. It's so, South Bay. Oh, the, that might have been Marty's house. Oh, maybe it was Marty. Well, yeah. uh, Keith's wife was there. I really thought it was oh, Keith's maybe. house. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and I, um, and I, I, oh, you know, and Keith, is, he's just the nicest guy, you know. Um, he took me down in his basement where he has his his big laboratory set up is you know i mean i really i was just like in awe i was like man this is the guy that is like you know mad scientist right he he was a real life mad scientist you know he was figuring ways to use electronics to to basically legally take money away from the casinos in ways that they would never guess and um you know, so I, you know, it, it definitely the the computer that I was selling really was a um, a, a rip off of Keith's computer. I mean, it had all the instructions were identical. You know, the the um, you know all the all the codes for you know uh, explaining the cards dealt and the the hits and the stands and you know everything it was just identical. It was like, so obvious. Like nobody could accidentally come up with all the same, you know. It was sort. Of, it sort of was almost like a a Morse code, you know, with with buzzes or or clicks or buzzes that would tell you, you know. And you know, so I immediately stopped selling the, um, the that computer and uh, and started selling Keith's computer. He didn't have a, an operating manual for his computer. Um, I, because I said to him, I said, you know, uh, you know, okay, uh, yeah, I can sell this. And, you know, I, maybe his, he, he told me 1800 bucks. I think he was undercutting the price of the, of the other one by a few hundred bucks for an, an authentic Keith Taft computer. And, um, and so I ended up writing an operating manual for it. You know, I sat down with him, you know, one afternoon and went over all the everything that somebody had to know and do and how the way everything worked and all the codes and you know, and um, and it was it was not very long. I don't need, I might have sold a few, you know, two, three, something like that. It was a high priced item, you know, but very shortly after that was. Uh, when uh, Nevada made their 
anti-device law. That was when they, they had caught Keith's brother, Ted, in a, in a casino with, uh, this one was using um, a, a, a camera that was in his belt buckle so that he could uh, view the dealer's hole card when they found a, a dealer that was, you know, loading it from the front. It would be at the table. I, I mean, he came up with crazy inventions that that worked, you know. And um, but Ted got busted for that, and uh, sh very shortly after that, uh, Nevada play, play, made their anti-device law. Was it eighty-three or eighty-four? Eighty-five. It didn't go into effect till 85. 85 yeah. Okay. Um, and you talk about, you tell all this in the book, the details of yeah, the bust. I, I, and, yeah, I talk about this um, stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And, and for people who are interested more, you also mention in the book that I did a long interview with, yes, uh, with um, Keith that's at your website. I um, mean, I put like, I, if you get the Kindle version of the book, I think there will be live links. Uh, to a whole lot of articles and stuff that were posted, and a lot of them were posted on Blackjack forums. Some of them are uh, gambling with an edge interviews with different ones of the authors and experts and professional players. Um, you know, there's there are so many links. And in the book, what I did was I simply posted the URL. Here, find an article about this here. Find an, A lot of them go back to Blackjack Forum articles that were written, you know, oh, 20, 30, 40 years ago about, you know, what happened with these, you know, with these different incidents and who these characters were. Um, you know, there's, there's more information by following the links than there is in the book because basically there's thousands of pages uh, of links that you could re read, interviews you can hear with different authors and things like that. John Esquaga's Nugget is in Sparks, which is just east of Reno. One time you got the casino manager to accommodate you. Tell us about that. Okay, actually there were two times I got him to accommodate me. Um, they had a, Should we ask them about the first one or the second one, Richard? <laughs> yeah. There were, there were um, they had a really good shuffle. It was a, a one pass shuffle, and you know, one pass shuffles were disappearing, and they had a really good one. Um, they they only had a few shoe games, and I think the table maximum there was uh, maybe two thousand. Um, whatever it says in the book is what it was. I, I'm sure I looked it up. Um, but uh, one day I went in there and uh, this I was playing by myself on this day. This is before before I had met Radar, actually. And um, I deposited money in the in the cage. And, you know, so I could just write markers and play. I went down, went to sit down at the uh, at the six deck table. You know, they had a they had a, a shoe game there. They didn't really reserve them, but there was nobody playing at hundred dollar minimum tables in there. You know, now they I'm sure they had a player here and there, but I would request a hundred dollar minimum on the table. They put the minimum up there, and basically I had the table to myself, which is good. You know, like on the weekends. You know, I, I mean, I, when I tried it on the weekends, the um, <laughs> the the table would get more crowded. They were one of the places where where the people, some guys with money would go in there. They could take action. But most of they still had single deck back then. They so were mostly th single yeah, deck. Yeah, so the right. shoe game usually would stay pretty right. pretty empty, right. especially with a 100 minimum. Yeah, it's like I, it bothered me. There were times it bothered me when players would show up because it wasn't a reserve table. And, uh, you know, and they they really couldn't. I don't think they could justify reserving it for me because they only had, I don't know what they had, 12, 15 tables maybe at most. Um, but anyway, what what happened, I went down there. I sat, I, you know, I already had my money in the cage. I, I sat down. I asked, to, you know, write a marker for, you know, whatever, so many thousand bucks. And, and uh, the dealer goes to shuffle the cards and he was doing a different shuffle. He was doing this, uh, what, what a, a shuffle tracker would call a two-pass shuffle, which is way more 
complicated and more complex and more difficult to track than a single pass shuffle. Single pass shuffles, one pass shuffles are like sort of like, you know, it's sort of it, to a shuffle tracker, a one pass shuffle is like what a single deck game is to a card counter. You're just going to get find many more opportunities and it's going to be much more e easy to uh, to exploit. And um, so he started doing a two pass shuffle. And um, I picked up my chips, went up to my room. There was no way I was going to try to play that. There, you know, there were other one-pass shuffles in Reno, and I was like, "Well, I'm not going to sit here and do this. This is, you know, this is too weak of a game." The reason I would come here is because the shuffle was so great. So I went up to my room and I called my host and I said, um, "I said this is, you know." I, you know, I don't know what you're doing. I, I know I, I won some money from you the last time I was here, but like, I really, you know, I resent this. You guys are switching up the shuffle on me now. You're now you're shuffling the cards different. I acted like this incensed millionaire that like was, you know, like accusing them of doing something to me. And he was like, no, no, I don't know what's going on. You know, you've got to talk to the casino manager. I'm sure you got it wrong. We're, no, we love your action, you know. Anyway, so... I went down, talked to the casino manager, you know, and he was basically saying, no, no, look, all of our shoe games, this is how we do it now. We changed our, this is the standard Las Vegas shuffle. It's all over Las Vegas, you know, and, and, you know, and I said, well, you know, look, I, I, I don't like it. You know, I, I just find this, you know, I'm, I just feel insulted. I, you know, and he said, look, I'll tell you what, I'm going to instruct the dealer to sh use our old shuffle for you. And I said, oh, okay, that's good then. That's good. Okay, I appreciate that. And he did. He asked the dealer, you know, you remember our, our old shuffle, you know, the one we used up till a month ago? He said, yeah, I know. He said, use that for Mr. H here. Anytime he, um, anytime he's here to play, you use that shuffle. He, he's a special guest. And you know, yeah, fine. So, you know, that I was like, okay, that was cool. That was cool. The very next time I went there, they didn't have any shuffle. They had a, an automatic shuffle machine on the table, and um, and it, I mean it was the it was the type where maybe all automatic shuffle. I, I've never played against them because for as a, for a shuffle tracker, they're a waste of time to even sit at the table. But uh, you know, their like their discard rack was just a little single deck discard rack because by the time he got to that many cards, he'd be putting them back into the machine. Oh, a continuous shuffler. Yeah. Wow. And um, and so, again, I was like, OK, I got to talk to the casino manager again. And now I, I really was like, you know, I don't know what's happening inside that black box. What's it doing? It could be doing anything. It could be programmed to, to, to take aces out of the day. He's like, no, no, this is they're using these all over Las Vegas now. And I said, I won't play those in Las Vegas. I play in Las Vegas, but if I see one of those now, I won't play there. He said, look, I, I mean, I, you know, I was telling you, I know a lot about this game. I've read books about this game. You know, this is, this is, you Forgot know. Forgot to I, tell him you've written books about right, this game. I, I neglected that, you know. But, um, and he was a really nice guy. His name was Mitch. And um, you're, he, I guess that's what they called him was Mitch. Uh, just a really nice guy. And he was like, okay, look. I'm going to have that, that automatic shuffler taken off of your table. Um, I'm, we're going to use our old, our old uh, six deck shoe and we're going to have the, um, we're going to have to have a, a, a discard uh, tray that'll take six decks installed and take. So come back in an hour. I'll have the, the uh, house mechanic come down here. And, and an hour later, I went down there. The guy's just finishing up with screwing in the, the, the six deck discard. And they gave me a, you know, a, a hand shuffled, you know, deck again. Now, what happened was, I think probably about a month after that, I was in Reno and I wasn't playing at the Nugget. I went over to the Nugget. I absolutely love, they have a, a, a restaurant there, Big John's Oyster House. My favorite restaurant in Reno. Um, if it's still there, it's it's the best in Reno. I, I love their Lazy Man's Chipino. I went over there to Sounds eat. Sounds like Arnold just found a recommended for the end of the show. <laughs> uh, oh yeah, sure. If you're in if you're in the Reno area, <laughs> that would be it. Well, who knows? It's not um, even John Esquaga's anymore, right? It's just I, the so, nugget. It's just the nugget. Yeah. 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 Okay. So it might because it was called Big John's Oyster House. So whether or not it's there, I have no idea. You can probably find online. But anyways, um, I 
went over there just to get the Chipino. And I looked and all there, there, they didn't have any hand shuffled game. You know, it's like, you know, they, they weren't going to leave that. And it was like, geez, every time I come in here, I got to call them and tell them, you know, and I felt like, no, this is getting too crazy. Cause then I also have to make sure I tell the dealer to use the, the old <laughs> shot. It's like, I just felt like, you know, how long can this last, you know? Um, especially if I am winning, <laughs> you know? So I, I, that was just like, I just thought, okay, I'll, I'll have to play other places. I can't, I can't go through this every time, but you know, they actually twice, they like bent over backwards to accommodate me. And, um, you know, I always got along with casino people. I like, I like my hosts there. I like the casino manager, you know, I just got along with them. I, I like the dealer. Dealers always like me cause I always toked. You know, it's like I was playing bigger money than most people in there. And and I was token the dealer, you know, a fair amount, you know, compared to just like a lot of people. I, you know, I basically, you know, I always followed um, Ian Anderson's uh, uh, advice to don't look like a card counter. You know, card counters don't toke. T card counters are not friendly with dealers and bosses. You know, they're, they're always trying to stay under the, under the radar and, you know, not be noticed. And, and he was, he had like a different attitude. Now, basically that only works if you're playing at really high stakes. Like there's no normal player that could say, well, I want you to change the shuffle on this. You know, it's like, no, I was one of their big players. And so they wanted to accommodate me, you know, and, um, I had that happen one time on a uh, a game where we wanted the six deck game and we went in and they had double deck and six deck and there was no six deck game available. And we turned around and we were leaving and the ship boss said, wait, where, where are you going? And he was like, oh, there's no six deck game. And he's like, well, I can give you a six deck game. And he pulls an electric drill out of the podium and goes to a dead game and like and he changes the discard rack and right. you know so they will they will if they like your action they'll they yeah. will you know do favors for you so uh-huh very good uh we're talking to arnold snyder we'll be taking a break and we have more questions for arnold when we come back the south point has more than ten thousand games returning at least 99 percent. this is more games than anyone else has in august to celebrate the south point 400 nascar race play 1800 dollars slots or video poker monday through thursday and pick up a free logo gift the first week is a logo toiletry bag if you earn and pick up all four gifts you'll receive 100 dollars in free play on august 30th although the gifts are better than average for casino gifts even if you value them as worth zero, earning and collecting all of them is worth an additional 1.4%. For locals, there is a Play X and Earn Y promotion every Friday through Sunday if they have your email address. If you haven't given them your email address, you can do it online at southpointcasino.com slash club, and you can be eligible for this promotion. If you do it by any Wednesday in the month, you'll be eligible for the following weekend and each subsequent weekend through the month. On Sunday, September 26th, South Point 400 NASCAR Cup Race at the Las Vegas Motor Speedway. Tickets are half price at the casino if you use your points. Hey guys, this is Colin from BlackjackApprenticeship.com. And if you're serious about card counting, I'd encourage you to check out the Blackjack Apprenticeship membership. It has the training tools you'll need to beat the game, like our comprehensive video course and our training suite, so you can learn each skill and virtually test yourself before ever stepping foot in a casino. It also includes the tools you'll need to succeed, like our pro betting software, casino database, results tracking software, and access to a community of like-minded advantage players to network with in our members forum and chat room software. You can find out more at blackjackapprenticeship.com. Videopoker.com is the best place to play lots of games. If you sign up for the gold membership, $8.95 a month or $79.95 a year, you get correction on most of the games. The game of the week is Magic Deal Poker. This is a 10 coins per line game where periodically, prior to the deal, you receive one, two, or very occasionally three Magic Deal cards. These are like wild cards, 
except they are determined after the other cards are dealt, and they must take the value of a three card, or of a real card, which means you cannot have five of a kind in a game like Double Double Bonus. The frequency of the magic deal cards depends on the game. On games where two pair receives even money, basically jacks are better or bonus poker, you get relatively... F- Excuse me, let me say that again. On games where two pair pays single money, which is jacks are better or bonus poker, you get a lot of magic deal cards because the four of a kinds aren't worth very much. On games where two pair gets even money, that means on those games four aces pay a ton, you get relatively few magic deal cards. All right, we're back with Arnold Snyder. There was a casino surveillance guy, you call him Larry, who called you up and said he noticed a friend of yours and his daughter using marked cards. Tell us about that. Yeah, this was a, uh, a call I got um, at home. Uh, I, I knew a number of uh, people in surveillance, and this, uh, this was a um, uh, pretty high up guy in surveillance at a, at a big uh, strip casino. And he said, um, he said, uh, he said, yeah, um, uh, we got, uh, we got uh, a few friends of yours, or at least I know one of your friends, Joey Dokes, which is a pseudonym I'm using. Uh, Joey is, um, is here and um, they're using Mark cards. And I just wanted to call you, you know, I'm getting a lot of pressure to, um, to call Metro and run these guys in. And um, he said, no, I think you know Joey. I just want to know, do you know anything about this? You know, we got his daughter too. And I said, I said, look, there's, there's no way Joey would be doing anything illegal. I don't believe it. And if he did, he wouldn't have his daughter involved. She's a college student. She's, she's like, like getting straight A's in college. She's, she's a good kid. He would never you know, I think I said something like his wife would strangle him if he got his daughter, you know, busted for, for you know, cheating in a casino. I said, I, I don't believe that's what's happening. And he said, well, you know, um, it's obviously a Mark card play. Uh, the, the, the anchor man, which would be a third base player, the anchor man is obviously uh, trying to see the top card of the deck. And that's the, the classic signal that somebody's, you know, looking for marks on cards. And, um, you know, the other players are, are, you know, are, you know, it's this is just does not look like a normal play. And I know a mark card play when I see one. Um, you know, I could get other surveillance guys over here and show them the video and they'd all agree with me. That's what it looks like. And, um, you know, and I said, well, look, um, it's not a mark card play. I know what they're doing, and it's just a it's just an advantage play, and um, and I know it because I know I know Joey is is doing this play, and um, you know you, you should really you gotta just you know you gotta let them go. You know don't confiscate their money. Don't have them arrested. You know just just take my word for it. Well, he, he didn't want to take my word for it. He's like, look, <laughs> you know I can recognize a mark card play you know that's what this is and i said no 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 i said look i said do you have do you have any of stanford wong's books and he said uh well uh, i think i have all of them they're on a shelf behind my head and uh and i said well do you remember he had a um he has a a, a chapter in in one of his books about um sorting the edges on b cards B is a type of, it's a brand name. It's a brand name of cards common in casino. Um, and he said, uh, well, I, I sort of remember that. I never heard of anybody doing it. I said, well, that's what they're doing, Larry. That's, I'm just telling you, that's what they're doing. You know, they're sorting the edges. If you, you know, if you examine the cards, you'll find out that there's uh, the pattern is not um, is not symmetrical on the, the the right edge and left edge look different, or either the top or the bottom edge look different. I said, but they're they're not symmetrical the way cards are supposed to be. They they're miscut, and that's what they're doing. So the guy that looks like he's looking for marks in the cards, no, he's just trying to see the edge, 
you know, all they do, do is sort the edges. There's, they don't change the cards. They don't mark them. They don't nick them. Nothing. There's, it's 100%. They're, they're, those are cards are 100% good cards. You know, that, that's all they're doing. I'm just telling you what you're going to find out if you take this to court because you're going to lose in court. And, um, you know, I'm, you know, you're going to go through a lot of a lot of hassle for nothing. So just let them go. Be, you know, be done with it. Now you recognize it. You know, hey, you're ahead of everybody else, you know, but, you know, and he he said um, he said, look, um, I'll go down and look at I'll look at the 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 decks. And if the decks are like you say, he said, we've been looking, examining these things for an hour. We've got three people trying to find marks on these cards. We can't find a damn thing. He said, I'll go. And if it's like you say that those cards are, are mis, they're, they were miscut and they're just sorting the edges. Well, OK, I'll um, uh, I won't I won't have them arrested, um, but I'm going to do the what we always do. We're going to. We're going to send their names and their photos uh, around uh, the sources that we send to in the industry to let people know this this team is out there doing this. And, um, you know, I won't take their money. You know, they won't have them arrested, but that's what I'm going to do. And I said, look, you can't do that. I said, you can't do it to Joey's daughter. I said, look, she's just a college kid. OK, don't don't get her in the Griffin book or biometric or anything. Just just let it go. Can't you just let it go? You know, you know, you can protect your casino. I guarantee you they'll never go back in your casino. <laughs> you know, they'll, they'll be scared shitless to go back there. And um, he said, well, OK, look, I'll make you a deal. If you get me a copy of uh, of Beyond Counting, which is James Grossjean's book, which was impossible for anybody to obtain. A thousand copies sold. I, I published it. Um, this was the first edition. It came out in the year 2000. Um, it, it was impossible to get. You know, the, a thousand copies sold out like in, in a month or two months or something like that. And, and uh, James said, well, uh, that's it. I'm not, I don't want to print anymore. I think there's enough copies out there. So he said, get me a copy of Beyond Counting, and I want it autographed by James Grossjean. <laughs> and I said, how, how am I going to get him to autograph it? Come on now. He said, you know, you're the publisher. This is what I want. If you do this, okay, what I'll do is I won't send it to Griffin or Biometrica. We won't take their money. Their pictures are going to go into our proprietary database. For us and our properties, we're going to know about these guys, but it's not going to go out. It's not going to go out anywhere else. But that's only if you can get me the autographed copy of that book. Otherwise, um, you know, yeah, then they're, they're going to be exposed all over. Extortion. Right. So I said, I just said, OK, yeah, I can get you a copy of the book. Don't worry. I'll make sure you get a copy of that book. But just let these people go. And um, and that's what he did. He um, he 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 wanted a copy of that book so bad that, you know, he was like willing to sort of like, I guess, compromise the standards of, of what was normal for their casino. Um, anyway, that that's the that was what happened with Larry. Uh, if you couldn't have gotten in touch with James, would you have willing to sign it yourself and tell him that James did it? Nah, I would have, I would have, I would have gotten it, you know, James would have understood. James would have understood. <laughs> and if James didn't understand, I think Joey Dokes would have explained to James in a way that James would understand that that was, you know, that was the thing to do, you know, so. we got a question from a listener who noticed that Norman Wattenberger on Blackjack Forum, Blackjack the Forum, is creating RICO, R-E-K-O. This is similar to one of the counts you've used. Do you feel that Norm took this system from you for Blackjack? No, no, not at all. Um, if I recall, R-E-K-O means real easy K-O. And it was a it was really a version of the KO count. Now the KO count was pretty much a version of my red seven count. It's an unbalanced counting system that you don't have to do math. You can just you know play according to running count. 
Um, you know, you have to use different indices based on the number of decks you're playing and things like this. But it takes the math out of the game. Um, that's the way I designed uh, the Red 7 count. And KO came out a few years later and did the same thing. Well, what Norm did was he took the KO count and simplified it further. And I'm, I, boy, I'm trying to remember what he did to even make it easier. Um, I but, don't remember either. Right. But that's, it's hard to get much easier right. than. Yeah. But that's what it, but that's what it was. It's the, as I recall, it's, it stood for real easy KO and he called it Rico. And, um, and no, it's, I, it's like, there's no, every, every card counting system, every legitimate card counting system for blackjack really owes its existence to Ed Thorpe. You know, Thorpe came up with beat the dealer he came up then with the with the uh, the easier way to do it, which was the first version of the high low count. <clears throat> and I mean, every counting system, you know, like nobody uses Thorpe's ten count anymore. That's so complicated. But that high low count variation is incredibly easy compared to the ten count. And um, again, now the high low count you needed to do the you had to do convert to true count and. And, you know, there was there was definitely math involved in it. And um, but every counting system is really just a version of that. Some somebody people are trying to either simplify it more, or, uh, make it easier, you know. Um, so I, you know, yeah, no norm could publish any card counting system, you know, I, you know. No problem. Nah. <laughs> for some inexplicable reason, you gave me a shorter answer than I was expecting. So we got another question for you. <laughs> You've been an expert witness for some court cases involving players. Which one would have been the most interesting to you? Um, okay, uh, I was I was I was an expert witness for uh, Ted Taft, who was uh, Ke Keith Taft's brother, who was busted using the the video camera on his belt. Uh, right. That that was interesting, but I I think the the um, the one that was the most interesting to me was uh, the um, there was uh, tell players there there were there was a dealer and a player that were busted at Harold's Club in Reno, and um, I don't think Harold's Club is there anymore, but it used to be the biggest biggest casino in Reno. In fact, I think might have been the biggest in Nevada when it first opened. And it was like one of the first big casinos to open in Nevada. Um, you know, Las Vegas was not what it was back then when it opened. But uh, he, there were a dealer and a player were arrested. They had videos of them playing. And the player kept making the right decision over and over and over again and on the, what on his blackjack hands on whether or not on the, on, based on the dealer's hole on the insurance right. on the insurance bet on, well that? the insurance bet also but all, just on how to play the hands and when he made this he made the the right decisions only when the dealer had to check her hole card so if she had a, a 10 or an ace and she had to look at her hole card you know the dealers don't do that anymore and in fact, this was this was one of the reasons why they stopped having dealers check hole cards like that. This and the other, the um, oh, the, a lot of the hole card techniques depended on the dealer peeking at her hole card. Um, but you know, this one was uh, what happened was they sent me these videos, and the de they said the de they the attorney contacted me. He said, look, I'm representing the dealer. The player has his own, uh, his own attorney. Uh, the dealer was female, player was male. Their names were Yip and Yin. And I don't remember which was Yip and which was Yin. One was Chinese, one was Vietnamese, as I recall. Um, but the, um, he said, uh, the videos really, they look like damning evidence. He said, because if you watch, he always makes the right decision when she looks at her whole card, whether or not he should hit her stand. He, you know, he, he, the, all the experts that have looked at this have said that she is verbally telling him, you know, how to play. You know, she doesn't have to do it loudly. 
you know, she she might have just um, some easy verbal signal to to give that doesn't sound like anything to any other players at the table. But you know, we don't see you know anything that he's doing. He's not catching the coal card. He's not card counting. He's not you know doing anything we can see. Um, she's telling him what to do because it's only when she knows what she has that he plays right. And he said, um, he said, I, I, I'd like you to look at the the videos and um, just give me an opinion. He said, the only reason I'm contacting you is he said, I honestly believe this girl that got busted. He said, she, I she's just not a person that would do that. She's, you know, she's, he said, I, you know, you can just tell when someone's honest, when they're being honest with you. He said, she never did anything with this. She doesn't even know this guy. You know, they don't even speak the same language. He doesn't speak English. And all he speaks is you know, whether, I can't remember if it was Chinese or Vietnamese, but you know, she speaks, you know, broken English, but she said, I don't even know how they could communicate. You know, he said, you know, I just think this is wrong. I believe her, but you know, I'm, I would like some expert to look at what they're looking at. Anyway, so he sent me the videos and the, it was a lot of videos because he, he sent me hours of video of, um, of her with playing against this player. And then he sent me like a couple hours of this dealer just dealing to tables of players where the guy wasn't sitting and nobody else was, you know, you know, playing correctly all the time. And now the, here, this is what, you know, what they call serendipity at the, at the time that he sent me these, I was uh, editing a book that Steve Forty had written called read the dealer. And it was about how players could read dealer tells. And, um, you know, Steve, yeah, and editing this now, you know, a number of blackjack authors, Stanford Wong, Ian Anderson, um, had mentioned the possibility of dealers, uh, dealers having tells and that when they peek at their whole card, if you can figure out their tells, you'll know how to play your hand. Well, Steve Forty wrote an entire book on how to do this. And the, you know, and I mean, I read his book going, wow, I wonder if this works, you know, because it was you know, it was completely outside my realm of knowledge on, on blackjack. And, um, and then he sent me these videos and I started watching them. And then I went back to Steve's book and I read the two chapters or one chapter it was the, the classic tells for a dealer, uh, saying, uh, she's pat or she's stiff. And, um, and I read those chapters and I went and watched the videos I could tell whether she was pat or stiff every single hand, just watching the videos. And, um, you know, and I called, uh, I called the attorney back. His name was Ron Bath. Uh, I doubt he's practicing anymore. But um, he, he, I said, look, you know, she's just, he, the, the player is playing tells. It's, he's, you know, I said, it's, he, he's reading her. And, he, and, you know, Ron, he was like, you know, look, is this something you can explain? Can anybody else understand this? I said, look, why don't I bring the tapes up to Reno? Um, we can sit down in your living room and, and watch the tapes and I'll show you how to read the dealer. I said, I think you'll be able to do it in 10 minutes. You'll know exactly whether she's pat or stiff. So I did that and I went up there. He was just thrilled. He was like, this is crazy. He said, you know, They've they've got like six expert witnesses. You know, they've got like surveillance people from, you know, half the casinos in Reno coming in to basically say that the obviously she's telling the player she's verbally telling him there's no physical signs she's giving. He said and he said, I, I can read this. And um, now the way they did it, he, basically he was attorney. He worked the way that, say, the, the classic attorneys work, which is to say, I never met the player, never met either player, n never talked to anybody but the attorney. I never got to watch any of the trial at all. I basically was, you know, sitting out in a, out in a room until they called me in, you know, the, 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 
both each attorneys ask me some questions, you know, basically deposing the, the witness, the expert witness, you know, they just want to know, do you have qualifications and, you know, whatever. And, and they ask you questions like, you know, do, do you know this person? Have you ever met this person? You know, I'm like, no, I honestly don't, you know, no, I just came up here. I was contacted by the attorney. You know, I watched the video. That's all I did. And, um, and then in the courtroom, I basically put the video on and would start it and stop it as I explained, okay, here's the classic tell for a dealer being pat. Here's the classic tell for a dealer being stiff. Okay, now let's watch and let's see. You See if you guys decide the same as the player at the table. And the entire jury was sitting there going, she's pat. She's pat. She's stiff. She's stiff. <laughs> she's pat. And the judge started doing it. I mean, the whole courtroom, and I'm, I know the, the, the attorney and the, the whole other side was sitting there like, oh, God, what, you know, here goes our case, you know. It is so obviously what this guy, what the player was doing. He was reading tells, the dealer, and to show that they were subconscious in the tapes where that player wasn't, the dealer kept exhibiting the exact same tells, but nobody was taking advantage. It was like this. She just she was showing, OK, I'm stiff. OK, I'm paying. None of their experts could see it. Now, what amazed me, the reason this was so astonishing to me was that Steve Forty wrote a book, had never seen this guy doing this. He had written a book that described these tells in detail, perfect detail, so that as soon as you see it, you could, you could, you know, I was like, you know, card counters spend months, a year trying to get proficient at counting cards. If you can find a dealer like this, you could just go in and clean up. It was like it took nothing. I mean, the attorney was doing all the jurors were doing it. They, you know, after the, the attorney told me after the case, he said he, he went out into the the courtroom lobby and he, and the, the 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 jurors were all hanging out there and talking and he said he said attorneys always like to do this they like to go out and talk to the jurors he said whether they win or lose the case they like to talk to the jurors and say well you know what did you think the strongest points uh, in this were and what do you think the weakest and you know he was out there he said he was trying to talk to the dealers to, to the jurors about um, you know what they thought of the presentation and he said. All the jurors could talk about was going over to Harold's Club and looking for dealers. And gee, do dealers do this in all casinos? And what, you know, he said they couldn't wait to go out there and start playing tells. A whole new generation of uh, advantage players. All right. Thank you, Arnold Snyder. This was great. His book is Radical Blackjack. Uh, Huntington Press is shipping them as we speak. Uh, they're available right now in several different modes. So thank you. At the end of our show, we have recommended. So, Richard, what do you got? Okay. Well, I had received an email uh, a few days back. A friend was uh, going to a wedding of a, uh, a guy who's a big whiskey drinker who likes all different kinds of whiskey. And, this, and the wedding was here in Vegas, and he wanted to know where he could go get some, you know, unusual whiskey to give the guy as a wedding gift. And um, I put it out to Cheaply. My... <laughs> no, che not cheaply. Uh, oh, just, just find unusual whiskeys. Um, so I, I put it out to my uh, resident expert, my son, uh, oh. and uh, who's very into whiskey. And uh, he mentioned that uh, there is a whiskey that is distilled in Nevada called Smoke Wagon. And the only place that he was able to find it was at the Total Wine on the uh, the Las Vegas Strip location. So um, other places to find whiskey are uh, Lee's and Roy's, which is on the west side. They have some bigger selections than most places. But also for whiskey drinkers, there are a couple of places, not where you can pick up bottles, but a place where you can sample unusual whiskeys. Um, and these come from Anthony Curtis, uh, Whiskey Attic, Double Helix, and Delmonico. So if you're into whiskey, that's where you can go drink it, but not buy a bottle. And Total Wine or Lee's 
or Roy's is where you can buy bottles of unusual whiskey. Huh, very good. My recommended is another Daniel Silva novel. This one's called The Order. This novel features uh, Gabriel Alon, who's an art restorer, and he's now head of the Israeli intelligence service. And this involves the death of a pope who may have been murdered. Alon saved the pope's life in an earlier book and now is called in to quietly figure out what really happened. I enjoy this series very much, and, and I think you will too. So, Arnold Snyder, do you have a recommended for us? Well, I think I'll go back to the um, the possibility that maybe there's still an oyster bar at the Nugget in Reno. Um, if there is, order the Lazy Man's Chipino. They call it Lazy Man's Chipino because all of the shells are removed. You get the shrimp without the shells. You get, in other words, they clean all the all the stuff. And it is. Why doesn't everybody do that? It is so good. I mean, I had that. I usually, if we stayed there a weekend, I would get it, you know, two or three days. Every time I would go, no, I, there's nothing else like this that anywhere that I know. The best Chipino. And I love Chipino. I love Chipino. I love Bullion Base. I'm, I really love, you know, good, good seafood soups and stews. This is just one of the best ever have no idea if it's still there. I haven't been up to Reno in, in years. So good luck. If it's I'm sure there. we'll hear from our <laughs> listeners if it's still there. When um, the South Point opened with their Big Sur Oyster Bar, Anthony Curtis compared it to uh, the one at John Esquaga's Nugget. So, and the one at South Point is definitely up and running. It is one of my favorite restaurants within the South Point. So, uh, if you're not going to go to Reno, go to South Point. So, thank you, Arnold Snyder. Thank you, Richard. Go out and hit lots of royal flushes, everybody. Good day. <laughs>